Yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Good the Jade Buddha Temple and the Abbot Venerable Jinkai for giving me the opportunity to speak here this morning. And I thank Venerable Katapunyo for his introduction. We were Dharma friends together many years ago. It seems almost like a past life in Kandy, Sri Lanka. And now it's a delight for me to see him here at the Jade Buddha Temple. Yeah, I chose the title of this talk as Bridging the Two Vehicles. The two vehicles refer to, I have to use with reluctance, the word Hinayana and Mahayana. But the word Hinayana is actually a derogatory term used to refer not really to the Theravada school, but to some of the other early Buddha schools in India. But it came to be used in modern times in relation to the Theravada school, so I'm just using it as a matter of convenience. So when I speak about bridging the two vehicles, I'm trying to lay down groundwork for understanding the relationship between Theravada Buddhism, which is an early form of Buddhism, and Mahayana Buddhism, the form of Buddhism that predominates in the countries of East Asia, like China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and then the later stage of development in Tibet. And this topic became of personal concern for me because my first encounter with Buddhism, or at least my first personal encounter with Buddhism, took place when I was a graduate student at Claremont Graduate University in California. I was I had become interested in Buddhism when I was in college. Then when I went to graduate school, <clears throat> I met a Buddhist monk from Vietnam who was studying at the same university. And he was from the Vietnamese Mahayana Buddhist order. And I wanted to learn Buddhism, and so I went to him and we became friends, and he became my first Buddhist teacher. And in fact, I was ordained at that time as a novice in the Vietnamese Mahayana system. After he went back to Vietnam, then I continued to stay in the, at the university, and I met several Buddhist monks from Sri Lanka who were passing through California, and one of them became a close connection of mine, and this induced in me the wish to go to Sri Lanka to be ordained as a Theravada Buddhist monk. And so I lived altogether in Sri Lanka for about 23, 24 years. Then I came back to the United States in 2002, and initially I was living in the Sri Lankan Buddhist temple in Queens, New York. But in the Sri Lankan temple in Queens, there were three residential rooms for the monks, one room, and there were five monks living at the temple. So one room was taken by the abbot, the chief monk. The other four resident monks were living two to a room, and I was living in the storeroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to find a place to stay. Then by coincidence, I met at a Buddhist function an elderly Chinese monk whose name was Venerable Renjun, Maybe some of you know him. And he invited me to come to his monastery, to see his monastery. So I came just on a, intending a short visit, and it was a very quiet place in the countryside of New Jersey. And Venerable Renjun was a very accomplished scholar of Buddhism, learned in both the Agamas, or the texts of early Buddhism, as well as the early Mahayana Buddhism. And the monks there seem to be very serious, very earnest in their studies and practice. And so I decided to stay on there, and I wound up staying there for more than four years. And then some of my students then invited me to move to another monastery, which is called Zhuangyan Monastery, which is in upstate New York. 
and that's, that's where I've been living now for almost 10 years. And so I've been exposed both by way of my profession as a Theravada monk, my personal commitment, as well as my initial introduction to Buddhism and my current environment to Mahayana Buddhism. And so this has sort of challenged me to develop in my own thinking some, understand, some way of understanding the relationship between these two major forms of Buddhism. Okay, the way, now to come into the way I would understand this relationship, first principle of understanding is that all schools of Buddhism, all authentic schools of Buddhism, trace their origins to the enlightenment of the Buddha himself. So we can say that all of them are in some way trying to preserve the essence of what the Buddha accomplished when he sat down under the Bodhi tree and then realized what we call Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the unsurpassed, perfect enlightenment. And the Buddha's enlightenment was not merely just a private event that took place in the Buddha's own mind, but it was an event that we could say ushered in a new period in the historical unfolding of human spirituality. Out of the Buddha's enlightenment, there emerged a new culture in India itself. There emerged vast systems of ethics, philosophy, scriptures, art, literature. There evolved a new vision of human relatedness, the ideal forms of human relationship. And so the Buddha's enlightenment had a very profound significance which may not have been fully disclosed in the Buddha's own actual teachings during his lifetime. It may have been that the Buddha's teaching, in a sense, initiated a process of spiritual revelation, spiritual realization, which required and even still requires his history, the unfolding of history as the ground or basis for its own unfolding, for bringing to light for bringing to manifestation the potentials that were realized by the Buddha in his enlightenment and that were set in motion by his turning of the wheel of the Dharma. And so we could see here, I would say in virtually every form of Buddhism, there is a certain tension involved which for a school of Buddhism to thrive and to flourish and to be authentic, it must find a way of negotiating this tension. And this is the tension between what I would call the conservative element and the progressive element. The conservative element is the need to be faithful to the Buddha's own enlightenment and to those teachings that were proclaimed by the Buddha during his lifetime on the basis of his enlightenment. In contrast to this is the progressive or de developmental element, which is the need for any school of Buddhism to keep alive and to flourish and to be relevant is the need to adapt to ad in order to address itself to the needs that arise in the particular historical period in which it is situated. That is, to address itself to the deep existential needs of the people living in that period, to address itself to, the, to, their, to, to adapt to their culture, their modes of understanding, to adapt to their, the pressures coming from their, 
forms of social organization and a variety of other factors. And so we have this tension between these, this conservative element always hearkening back to the Buddha's enlightenment and the original teaching and this developmental strain which is always having to adapt to these various pressures, social, cultural, intellectual pressures. If a form of Buddhism <laughs> adheres too rigidly to the conservative element, trying to maintain the original teaching but not adapting sufficiently to the culture, then it is going to become stagnant, to atrophy, to become fossilized. If it, on the other hand, gives too much emphasis to the developmental aspect and loses sight of the ground of the teaching in the Buddha's original teachings, then it can adapt itself and modify itself to the point where it virtually loses its Buddhist identity and just becomes blended into the popular religions or popular culture of that particular period. <clears throat> and so, whoops. So, to illustrate this relationship between what I call the conservative element and the progressive or developmental element, I use the simile of a planet which is circling around the sun. In order for the planet to remain in orbit, it has to strike a balance, a balance which is created on the one hand by the gravitational pull of the sun, which is pulling on that planet and trying to pull the planet towards the sun. On the other hand, the planet has its own momentum, which is keeping it in an orbit, in a circle. And if the planet neglects the gravitational pull of the sun and just follows its momentum, then it will fly out of orbit and just get lost in the vastness of space. So that illustrates the progressive element. And so it's through this balance between the pull of the sun and the direction of the momentum, the force of the momentum, that the planet remains in a circular orbit around the sun. And so we could see this as illustrating what any form of Buddhism must do in order to remain vibrant, healthy, and yet authentic to balance that conservative element, looking back to the Buddha's enlightenment, looking back to the core teachings, to balance that with the developmental aspect, the adaptive side, adapting to culture, the psychology of people, the social conditions of the time. Okay, now applying this now to a problem of how to understand the relationship of these two major strains of Buddhism, the early Buddhism represented by the Theravada and the Mahayana. I think it's first necessary to accept the historical understanding of Buddhism that has been presented to us by the scholars and researchers who have looked into the history of Buddhism. And what, when we do this, what we see is that there was a period which we call early Buddhism, which was the Buddhism originally, t the Buddhism is taught by the Buddha, the teachings that have been collected into, in the Pali tradition, we have the four or five Nikayas. In the Northern tradition, there are the four Agamas, which were translated into Chinese. So this would represent the earliest stratum of Buddhism that's available to us. The stratum that preserves what are probably direct 
teachings from the Buddha and from the Buddha's own personal disciples. But Buddhism didn't remain stagnant with the different generations of monks and nuns just reciting the teaching, repeating it like parrots. But beyond the stage of early Buddhism, there comes a stage in which the Buddha scholars, you know, the masters of Buddhist doctrine, began to investigate the teachings, to draw out their implications, to try to systematize them, to explore problems, to investigate problems that came out from the teachings that were not answered by the teachings themselves. And in this way, we get a period that is, comes to be called sectarian Buddhism, where the early original Buddha Sangha splintered into a number of schools which adhered to basically the same nucleus of teachings, the same basic collections of the Buddha's discourses, but differed in their philosophical understandings of the teachings. And then, over time, as further investigations, explorations continued, a new class of scriptures emerged, which are now known as the Mahayana Sutras, which themselves developed in several waves of composition, stretching from roughly 300 years after the passing of the Buddha, maybe second century BC, up to maybe about the fifth century of the Common Era. Okay, and so this marked the emergence of Mahayana Buddhism, which then brought forth a new, whoops, a new generation of scholars and thinkers and philosophers who based themselves on the Mahayana Sutras, and out of them developed systems of thought, which became the Mahayana, the Shastras, or treatises of the Mahayana, which systematized the different schools of Mahayana Buddhist philosophy. Okay, so the key point that I want to bring out from this very concise overview of the history of Indi Indian Buddhism, in about, which I presented in about two minutes, is that the ideals and doctrines of Theravada Buddhism, or early Buddhism, and Mahayana Buddhism arose at different historical periods and came out of different bodies of literature. So it would be a fundamental mistake to adopt a kind of, I recall this, a kind of Mahayana fundamentalism and say that all of these scriptures were taught by the Buddha during his own lifetime, ranging from the Nikayas, Agamas, to the Avatangsaka Sutra, or Lankavatara Sutra, and then say that since these teachings are so different, we have to figure out their relationship. This is the problem that was actually faced by the early generations of the Chinese Buddhists, who were receiving different waves of Buddha scriptures, all ascribed to the Buddha, all of them opening with the words, thus have I heard, and the Buddha was living at Shravasti or at Rajagaha, and he gave this discourse either to the monks or to a great assembly of bodhisattvas. And so they had to figure out how do these teachings, how are they to, to be integrated? How do they fit together? And so they worked out certain systems of interpretation that are called, I think, Pan Jiao. Is that my pronunciation all right? Okay. Pan Jiao, yeah. Uh, okay. Very good, well. Wow. Okay, so what was done, I think the, the dominant system of Pan Jiao is that of the Tiantai school, which says that immediately after the Buddha's enlightenment, he realized and spoke the Avatangsaka Sutra, Huayanjing, but nobody could understand it. <laughs> and so he realized he has to start with the ABCs, <laughs> not, 
not with nuclear physics. And so then he went to the beginning and started by teaching the Agamas, the Ahanjing. Then at a certain point, he realized that his audience was, had been matured. So then he started to teach the Prajnaparamita Sutras. And then by stages, he went on until in the last stage of his life, he taught the Lotus Sutra, the Fa Jing, and the Mahaparinibbana Sutra. Okay, the reason why the Chinese scholars came up with these theories is because they didn't have the historical perspective that has been given to us by the generations of Western scholars who have looked into the historical development of Buddhism. And so from, the, from this historical perspective, we can understand that the distinctions between the different schools of Buddhism, the different scriptures of Buddhism, represent different historical periods. They come out of different stages in the historical evolution of Buddhism. And when I say this, I have to make very clear at once that I myself am not adopting a scriptural fundamentalism, which one sometimes sees amongst rather conservative Theravadan monks or followers of Theravada Buddhism who say the Nikayas are the fundamental teachings of Buddhism, the original teachings of the Buddha, this is the authentic Dharma, all of that Mahayana teaching is just degeneration, later corruptions by people who thought they knew better than the Buddha. So that is one perspective which I reject. The other perspective may be held by some of the Mahayana proponents who say the Mahayana teachings give us the real thing. They reveal the Buddha's true intention, whereas the scriptures of the preserved in the Theravada tradition, that is just the ABCs, the sort of kindergarten teachings for those who are not yet as mature as we are, <laughs> those of us who can penetrate the deep teachings of the Mahayana. Okay, so avoiding these two extremes, I take a sort of a starting point for establishing a relationship between the early teachings and the Mahayana is that they are both systems revolve around different ideals. The Theravada or the early teachings takes as its guiding ideal that of the Arahat. The Arahat is the person who has followed and practiced the teaching of the Buddha walked the Noble Eightfold Path and thereby broken the bonds that tie one to the cycle of birth and death, the cycle of samsara, and gained the unconditioned freedom, peace, liberation of nirvana. Okay, the Mahayana <coughs> Buddhism takes as its ideal that of the bodhisattva. <clears throat> the bodhisattva is one who says that he is, or she is following the example of the Buddha, who makes the vow not to gain quick or personal liberation from the cycle of birth and death, but who aspires to reach the supreme enlightenment of Buddhahood and thereby gain the ability to expound the Dhamma in detail to the world, to reveal the Dhamma to the world, and liberate countless sentient beings. And so when you look superficially at these two different ideals, they seem to be very different, even in a kind of tension with each other. But the way I see it, or try to understand it, is that both traditions are looking to the Buddha himself as the ideal. It's just that they are looking at the Buddha 
from different perspectives, from perspectives stemming from their different historical situations. The follower of the Arahat ideal is looking at the Buddha from the standpoint of the early stage in the evolution of Buddhism, whereas the practitioner or follower of Mahayana Buddhism who is pledged to the Bodhisattva ideal is looking at the Buddha from the perspective of a later stage in the historical evolution of Buddhism. Yet it's not that the follower of Theravada Buddhism is discarding the Buddha himself and putting the Buddha in the background and saying we're just going to follow the example of the Buddha's Arahat disciples but rather they are both looking at the Buddha, but looking at him from a different perspective, from a different angle. And I illustrate this in my own thinking by a piece of sculpture that I saw several times when I was living in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, there's a famous temple dating from about the 15th century it's near Kandy, it's a, the temple is called the Lanka Tilaka Temple, which has a gigantic image of the Buddha. And what is famous about that statue is that if one stands in one position and looks at the Buddha, he seems to be completely absorbed into a deep transcendental samadhi. The face is perfectly serene, equanimous. The eyes look closed as though he's completely beyond the world. But if one moves into a different position and looks at the Buddha, the eyes seem to be a little bit open, like half open, and that completely cool, equanimous expression gives way to a soft, gentle, delicate smile and kindly and compassionate expression. And yet it's the same piece of sculpture, but when looking at it from different angles, it presents a different face. And so we could see this, use this as an example, or I do in my thinking, to see how both the followers of early Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism, followers of Mahayana Buddhism, are looking at the Buddha, but looking from different angles, the angle being basically determined by that historical period out of which these schools emerge. And the way now I contrast these different understandings of the Buddha I use different expressions to characterize the points of view. I say that the follower of the Theravada tradition, or especially those who adhere closely to the Nikayas, are looking at the Buddha from what I call the historical realistic perspective, whereby they see the Buddha as a human being just like ourselves, who underwent a period of inner suffering, inner struggle, renounced the household life, achieved liberation, and then decided to teach. Whereas the Mahayana Buddhism is looking at the Buddha from what I call a cosmic, mythical, and metaphysical point of view. And I call it cosmic because they are looking at the Buddha not, <clears throat> not just from the life in which he achieved supreme enlightenment, but they're looking at him in terms of what we would call his long-range cosmic background to the achievement of Buddhahood. What did the Buddha have to pass through? What did he have to undertake and cultivate? over many lives to achieve Buddhahood. So that is the cosmic perspective. And once that emerges, then we have a whole 
veritable ocean of stories emerging about the practices that the Buddha undertook in his past lives to achieve Buddhahood. These stories then become called the Jatakas, the stories about the Buddha's self-sacrificial deeds by which he accumulated the merits to achieve Buddhahood. And so these stories give us their legendary stories, how the Buddha was at times a king, a minister of state, a deer, an elephant, a monkey king, and so forth. So I call this the mythical side to the Buddha's achievement of Buddhahood. And then the metaphysical side comes out of the philosophical perspective or the philosophical process of reflecting on the figure of the Buddha himself. So what was the Buddha really? What does he represent in his person? And then they thinkers who followed that track came to see the Buddha as the visible representation of the Dharma itself. So the Buddha becomes a kind of visible manifestation of suchness or emptiness or the Dharmakaya, the embodiment of the Dharma. Okay, so that is a general way in which I characterize the different perspectives these two traditions take on the Buddha. Okay, now I want to elaborate a bit on this, starting from the perspective of the Nikayas, which are, to our knowledge, they are like the oldest surviving texts of the Buddhist tradition. Okay, the, I say that the Nikayas give us the historical realist perspective on the Buddha because they place the Buddha squarely within the human condition, very much as we know it in our day-to-day -day lives. So we see that the Buddha, well, maybe the birth story of the Buddha, even in the Nikayas, is not very realistic <laughs> since it shows all of the wonders and miracles that take place with the Buddha's birth. But once we get past the birth, we find the Buddha in his early stage as a young man who marries, has a child, and then starts to reflect on the problems of human existence. He reflects that here I am, a young man who's subject to old age, sickness and death, subject to sorrow, misery and grief, why am I living this life? Why don't I go forth and seek that which is outside the cycle of birth, old age, and death? And then he renounces the household life. He shaves off his head. He becomes a wandering ascetic. He learns meditation from several of the prominent meditation teachers of the time, rejects them, undertakes extreme ascetic practices for six years. I mean, I've done ascetic practices for two or three days, and I realized they were not going to take me to enlightenment. <laughs> 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 but he follows them for six years until he comes to the, virtually to the point of death and then realizes that this is not the way to enlightenment. Okay, then he takes the new course that we call the middle way, regains his strength, achieves enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and then he reflects, should I go out and teach the Dhamma? And then he looks out at the world, reflects on the world, and thinks people, their minds are just so heavily weighed down by lust, hatred, and ignorance. I can't do it too much. Let me just say quietly enjoying the bliss of liberation. So the Buddha almost becomes, you know, the Pacheka Buddha or Pratyeka Buddha. That's another figure in the Buddha's pantheon, one who attains enlightenment but doesn't try to teach the Dhamma to others. So the Buddha almost becomes a Pratyeka Buddha 
until this deity Mahabrahma Sahampati comes down from the Deva world or the Brahma world and begs the Buddha, please, venerable, there are people in this world who can understand. And then finally the Buddha decides to teach and then he goes forth and for 45 years we see him wandering the roads of northern India, establishing a Sangha, having to regulate, administer, sometimes quarrelsome, conflicted order of monks and nuns with great difficulties until he passes away. So this gives us a very, very you know, vivid historical picture of the Buddha as a real human being living in this human world. Okay, from this perspective now, this historical realistic perspective, the Buddha's great achievement is the attainment of, or the discovery of the path to nirvana and the realization of nirvana himself. And so the Buddha becomes the first arahat in the world. A person who achieves nirvana is called an arahat. The word arahat was not invented by the Buddha. It was a word in circulation amongst the spiritual communities in the Buddha's own time. And so when the Buddha achieved enlightenment and broke all of the bonds that bind him to samsara, he declared, I am the arahat in the world. And his followers, those who followed his guidance and achieved enlightenment under his guidance, also became arahats. And so the Buddha is the pioneer in the quest for arahatship, and the disciples are those who achieve arahatship by realizing nirvana under the Buddha's own guidance. And it's interesting, when we look in the early scriptures, we find sometimes the texts that describe the Buddha's own process of realization and the realization by the Buddha's disciples are almost the same or very close. For example, there is sutta number four, Majjhiminikaya sutta number four, in which the Buddha describes his achievement of enlightenment. And he explains that he stirred up his energy, he overcame the five hindrances, the five obstacles of the mind. He entered the four jhanas, or meditative absorptions, and then he achieved the, th the three vidyas, the three higher knowledges, the recollection of past lives, the divine eye through which he could see how beings pass away and take rebirth in accordance with their karma, and the knowledge of the destruction of the defilements. And then if we look at Majjhiminikaya Sutta number 27 and Sutta number 51, we see that the achievement of enlightenment by the disciples, by the Arahat disciples, are described in exactly the same terms. One overcomes the five hindrances, masters the four jhanas, and achieves the three higher knowledges. There's another sutta which brings up, the, in which the Buddha himself brings up the question, what is the difference between the Tathagata, who is the fully enlightened one, and a monk who is an arahat liberated by wisdom? And the answer that's given is that the Tathagata is the one who discovers the path who finds the path, who opens up the path 
and makes it known to the world. And then the arahat disciples are those who follow the path and achieve liberation through the guidance of the path. So if we take these suttas as authoritative, then the essential difference between the Buddha and the Arhats is that the Buddha is the pioneer, the one who finds the way to liberation and nirvana, the one who sort of opens up a path through the jungle so that others can follow in his footsteps. And secondly, the Buddha is the one who knows the entire, let's see, the entire process of cultivating the path, who knows and understands all of the obstacles, who understands all of the aids to the development of the path, and who could guide disciples through their inner obstacles to achieve the final goal. Whereas the disciples who come after the Buddha don't have these abilities to the same extent that the Buddha does. So this begins to open up certain differences between the Buddha and the Arahat disciples. Differences which then come to be focused upon by later generations of Buddhist thinkers. So the Buddha is not only the one who first achieves nirvana, but he's one who gains certain powers of knowledge through which he can guide disciples through all of the difficulties that they face on the path. He has, these are laid out in what are called the ten Tathagata, powers of knowledge. Amongst them is the ability to understand the maturity in the faculties of other people. So the Buddha can look at a person and can know whether that person's, whether their faculty of faith is strong, faculty of wisdom, whether all the faculties are weak, of middle strength, of a high degree of strength, the Buddha also has the ability to know all of the dispositions, proclivities, and temperaments of beings. So he, when he's teaching people, even an audience of people, he could speak the Dharma in a way that will speak to each person. So everyone will feel that the Buddha is speaking personally and directly to, to themselves. Yeah, there's one little incident or story that comes down in the commentaries which illustrates this. The Buddha's chief disciple in wisdom was named Sariputta, probably most of you know. Sally Boo. Okay. <clears throat> the Sariputta had a disciple who was ordained under him, and it was a young man who came from a wealthy family. <clears throat> and Sariputta thought for young people, what is a suitable meditation subject? The meditation on the impure nature of the body, which is intended to counter sensual desire. So Sariputta taught this young monk the meditation on the impure nature of the body. The young monk practiced, kept on practicing, couldn't get any success, couldn't reach any attainments through his practice. He became sad and despondent, came to Sariputta. Sariputta kept on encouraging him. No success. Then Sariputta thought, I have to take him to the Buddha. And so he brought Sariputta to the Buddha. The Buddha looked at him and realized this young man in 500 previous lives had been a goldsmith. And so he loved beautiful things. And so the Buddha taught him, uh, the Buddha used his psychic powers to create a beautiful lotus flower and told him, focus on that lotus flower and do meditation on the lotus flower. 
So the young man did meditation on the beautiful lotus flower, and suddenly his practice starts to mature. He goes into samadhi. Then the Buddha tells him, come out from samadhi. He comes out. Then the Buddha says, now look at that lotus flower, that magical lotus flower, and see it start to wither and decay. So the young man starts looking at the lotus flower. He sees it wither and decay until he sees impermanent. And then he does meditation on impermanence, and then his insight goes deeper and deeper until he achieves our hardship. Okay, so these ideas that we find even in the Pali Nikayas and in the early commentaries start to show us how t despite the fact that both the Buddha and the disciples are arahats, there is some difference between them in that the Buddha is the pioneer and also the supreme, unsurpassed teacher. Okay, now as time went by and we move from the stage of early Buddhism to the sectarian period where the Buddhist thinkers are now starting to look back at the figure of the Buddha and to reflect how did the Buddha become that perfect supreme teacher? They began to come to, to reflect that this must have been the result not only of his practice in that final life, but it must have been the culmination of a whole process of spiritual development that went on over hundreds and thousands of lives even over many cosmic aeons. And during this period, they reflected, the Buddha it must have started many aeons ago, and then a certain story emerges which becomes common to the different Buddha schools, that aeons ago, the Buddha was an ascetic by the name of Sumedha who met a previous Buddha named Dipankara. And during that time, the future Buddha, the ascetic Sumedha, met the Buddha Dipankara and bowed down to him and made a vow not to become an arhat, but to follow the path that the Buddha took to achieve Buddhahood in the future. And when he made that vow, then Dipankara, the Buddha, gave him the prediction, in the future, you will become a Buddha by the name of Gotama. And after that, it said that the ascetic Sumedha reflected, how, what do I have to do now to become a Buddha? And he realized he had to practice certain virtues which come to be called paramis or paramitas, spiritual perfections. And so out of this story now, this story, there comes the idea that for a being to become a Buddha, one has to generate an aspiration, which comes to be called the bodhicitta, the bodhishin in the Chinese tradition. And then one has to undertake practices over many, many lives to become a Buddha. Okay, now from this story, initially the story was intended, okay, from the story the idea then emerges that the future Buddha Gotama was not the only bodhisattva, but throughout cosmic time, there have been countless beings who have made that vow and follow the same pattern, the same process to achieve Buddhahood. So these beings are the bodhisattvas. And once they achieve Buddhahood, then they set and will the motion of Dharma and liberate countless beings. Initially, probably in the early stages, this idea 
was intended descriptively to describe the process by which a being or a person becomes a fully enlightened Buddha. The process is generate the bodhicitta, practice paramitas with generosity, virtue, patience, energy, meditation, wisdom, and then generate to many other meritorious deeds. And when all of these come together, one achieves Buddhahood. But at a certain point, probably some of the Buddhist thinkers started to reflect, why treat this concept of the Bodhisattva descriptively only? Why not take it as the model for our own aspirations and practice? And so at that point, I would say, a transition is taking place from the early form of Buddhism to probably the earliest stage of Mahayana, which has not actually been preserved in any scriptures, because probably the earliest Mahayana scriptures take shape only after Mahayana Buddhism has reached, we call the second level of development. But when we look from the Mahayana scriptures that we have, the early texts, like the perfection of wisdom in 8,000 lines, we could see a process starting to take shape whereby the generation of the bodhicitta and the practice of the paramitas has now become the prescriptive course for one who wants to follow the Buddha on the way to full enlightenment of Buddhahood. And then once this model of the Buddha's path is propagated and spread amongst the Buddhist population at large as an alternative to the Eightfold Path to Arhatship, then we're starting to get full-fledged Mahayana Buddhism. And so in this way, by taking this historical perspective, we can see how Mahayana Buddhism emerges as Buddhism evolves from the stage, the early stage represented by the Nikayas, to the first intermediate stage represented by the sectarian schools reflecting on the Buddha's path to enlightenment, to the earliest stage of Mahayana, where the bodhisattva ideal is starting to take shape, a stage not preserved in any literature, till we come to the early Mahayana sutras, in which we have a quite remarkably consistent and clearly defined conception of the bodhisattva path and practices. And so the point that I want to make through this talk is that when we adopt this historical perspective, we can see how different Buddhist ideals, different system systematic representations of Buddha's practice emerge at different periods, reflecting different stages in reflection on the Buddha's enlightenment, responding perhaps to different social pressures of the time, um, to different stages in reflection on, uh, of Buddhist reflection. And using this model, I think we can have, as we find Buddhism evolving here in the United States, a particular model that we can use to generate respect and understanding between followers of the different forms of Buddhism. And here in the United States, more broadly in the West, or even in the modern world, we're in a very different situation from that in which the pre-20th century Buddhists of Asia found themselves. Before the 20th century, Buddhism in Asia was sort of locked up in three different silos, three different geographical regions. So in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, Theravada Buddhism flourished. 
based on the Pali Tripitaka in the countries of East Asia, China, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, we have the East Asian form of Mahayana Buddhism, all of them probably evolving out of Chinese Buddhism from different periods. And then in northern or the Himalayan region, we have Tibetan Buddhism, which represents a later stage in the evolution of Mahayana Buddhism in India. So the Tibetan form of Buddhism is called Vajrayana Buddhism. And in these three different geographical regions, the Buddha's followers had almost no idea that there were other regions of Asia in which there were Buddhists following different forms of Buddhism. But here now in the modern world, maybe especially here in the United States, all of these three major Buddhist traditions are coming together. And so there can be two different responses to this encounter of the Buddhist traditions. One response is to maintain the secluded, um, silo mentality or competitive mentality. We have the true authentic teaching. Let them do their things. Let them call themselves Buddhists. But we really know better who the true Buddhists are. <laughs> so that is one kind of mentality. The other kind of mentality is that of what I would call generating respect and understanding. So sometimes we speak of tolerance, but I say tolerance is not enough. One has to go beyond tolerance and respectful, respectfully try to understand the other Buddha schools and even engage in the practices, other forms of practices, other types of study to widen and expand one's understanding. Some might take it another position and say, okay, the different forms of Buddhism that flourish in Asia, that is typical of the Asian mentality. But here in America, we are more sophisticated. What we can do is combine all the schools and come up with a grand <laughs> synthesis, the grand bargain of Buddhism. But I think First of all, that would be disrespectful to each of the schools because we have to respect the distinctive standpoint and practices of each of the schools. And also, it would be almost a bit of an exercise in arrogance to think that it took Buddhism something like, say if we go from the Buddha's time to Tibetan Buddhism, 14th century, 20 centuries to evolve in Asia. And here in America, within a space of a few years, we know better how to combine all the schools into one grand, grand synthesis. But as a friend of mine puts it, that would be like taking paints of different colors and putting them all into a blender. And when you blend all of these colors, red, blue, green, yellow, purple, what do you get? Some kind of dull grayish brown. <laughs> and so though we like brown robes, but let's not come up with a brown form of Buddhism. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I've overgone my time limits or whether... <laughs> I don't know how, up to what time I was supposed to speak. To 11.30. Are, are we supposed to take questions? There was the idea. Excuse me? There was the idea to take questions. Now, okay, good. Okay. Whenever you are ready. Okay, I should be ready. <laughs> I have to be ready. <laughs>
prior to you, if you have any questions, please come forward. We will give you the mic and uh, you can ask the questions yourself. So at this point, um, I would like to know if anyone has a question for the venerable Carlos. Okay, here we go. Okay, I have four rules that I always tell people when they want to ask questions. First, I have to give the four rules, if I could remember them. First, step, you're always standing up. Okay, you follow the first rule already. The first is to stand up. The second is to speak clearly into the microphone. The second is, or the third is to keep the question relevant to the subject matter of the lecture, at least fairly relevant. The fourth is please ask a question if the speaker wants to give a lecture I'm willing to step down and let them <laughs> come up. <laughs> and I've had to formulate those rules based on personal experience. <laughs> don't take it personally. I'm not, I don't have any idea what your question is. But this is my past experience where the person asking the question goes on and on and on until I get a little drowsy. <laughs> Okay, please. Uh, yeah. From what you have said, uh, many, I understood that the bridge that you are making, I'm going to follow that theory. From all that you have said, I could see that the only historical facts that the all the scholars and people that you learn seriously, yeah. the development of Bodhi. Yeah, I'm, I'm not catching. That all the people that is learning seriously the development of Buddhism, uh, there is a point that, in some way, in this part of the bridge, one column of the bridge, we have the, the what really the Buddha spoke at that time. Yeah. And in this other part, we have seen historically and shown by the, by the experts yes. that they are some suttas that really they were not spoken by the Buddha. Yeah. So the bridge that you are trying to do is here is a, a, a reality, a, a through teachings and here kind of were put new things over there to the understanding and very well thinking Buddhist at that time. And yeah. the student for this other side is not as strong as should be yeah. because all the historical facts are yeah. showing that this side is not really true. So the bridge that you are trying to build is not uh, going to fall down. Is what? Is not going to work the bridge that you are trying to to do because yeah. of that situation. Yeah. Okay. I, let me see if I understand the question. Okay, you're saying that because what I say is that the scholars, the textual, textual Western scholars, have come to the conclusion that the teachings represented by the Nikayas, for example, or the Agamas, come from an older historical period which most likely preserves the actual discourses of the Buddha himself, whereas the Mahayana sutras are concluded to be like compositions coming from a later period. So therefore that the bridge that I was trying to present is not going to work. Is that what the point is? Okay, okay. I think one has to understand here as I said, I don't take the, the standpoint of a textual fundamentalism. I think one has to respect what I would call the historical conclusions, and that is that these discourses preserved in the Nikaya's Agamas are much more likely to have come from the Buddha himself, though we always have to remember, as compiled, edited, recorded, preserved by, gen by the early generations of monks, you know, we didn't have tape recorders coming from the, in, the, in the Buddha's time, so we don't have actual recordings of his teachings. But this is the way the early circle of disciples preserved and compiled his teachings. Now, I don't think that the Mahayana Sutras, because they come from a later period, 
of, so I say that one can't ascribe them you know, literally to the Buddha himself, but what I would say that they are trying to do is to bring out or to represent reflections by the Buddhist community of that period as they're looking back on the Buddha, the figure of the Buddha, and trying to understand and to explain how the Buddha reached the stage of Buddhahood. And what's an interesting problem, which I've not been able to solve, in the early texts, nobody comes to the Buddha and ever asks, on the basis of what practices through past lives did you achieve Buddhahood? Because it's pretty clear from the early scriptures, I would say that the Buddha has a different spiritual status from that of the disciples. He's not merely the pioneer, not merely the first one to achieve our hardship, but he is the one who has broken through that net of ignorance for the first time and then acquires all of these powers of knowledge, these psychic powers that enable him to establish the Dharma at a time when it's not known in the world. And yet, whenever people come, especially the monks, come to the Buddha and say, teach us, Bhante, the way to the eradication of defilements. Teach us the way to liberation. Teach us how to overcome these hindrances and obstacles. And then the Buddha gives them the teachings. But nobody comes and says, teach us, Bhante, the way to Buddhahood. And this, to my mind, it raises the big question. Why is that question never raised in the Pali suttas or in the Agamas? And even before the rise of Mahayana Buddhism, this question came up, and we find it even in the scriptures of Theravada Buddhism in two, at least two works. One is the Buddha Vangsa, which gives us the story of the Buddha's encounter with, the, when the Buddha was the ascetic Sumedha, the story of his meeting with Dipankara, and then the story of how he reflected on the paramitas. And we find similar stories in other schools of early Buddhism. And another work is called the Charya Bitaka, which deals with the practices of the Bodhisattva. Now these are works that come in the Theravada school, and yet they provide us, and they're ascribed to the Buddha as though the Buddha spoke them. And they provide us a kind of, or they show us a transitional stage leading into the Mahayana. So it's only a slight, it seems like a few steps further for the early Mahayanas to compose sutras which were then ascribed to the Buddha to explain the way to, to Buddhahood through the Bodhisattva path. I'm not getting the sound so clearly. Um, you could you expand on the transition period when Prince Gautama decided to give up the royal household life yeah. and go to the homeless life? Uh, in the book and in your take, uh, you have discussed him through the three divine messengers. Yeah. Um, but um, there's also the story of him being born and uh, this very dramatic story of walking seven steps and of the story of what? When Father was born, yeah. he is taking seven Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> yeah. In your take, you mentioned that he must have had some insight at some point in time that he's not an ordinary man. Some insight? Into that he's not an ordinary man and he has, he's just, you know, his destiny is something bigger. Yeah. So could you just expand on that and you say, okay, what exactly do you mean by um, him having this revelation of sorts and when he gives up the royal yeah. life and all this stuff? Yeah. 
Okay, you, you mentioned first a story about his birth, which I referred to during my talk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we could take that. In fact, I see that. I think it's probably likely. I would have to say a, a later, <laughs> a, a later composition, which was inserted in order to glorify the Buddha, and then the story of his renunciation. When we go to the earliest texts, we don't find the story about the divine three divine messengers. In fact, a lot in the traditional story of the Buddha reflects a stage of later glorification and sort of mythical um, development. You know, the, st the story that the Buddha was the son of a king, that he had the right to the kingship, and then he gave that up in order to renounce. But actually the Sakyan state, it's known, was not a monarchy, and the Buddha was not a prince in the sense of the son of a king, but the Sakyans were ruled by a council of elders. Maybe his father was the president of that council of elders. And the Buddha would have been brought up in wealth and luxury. That, that is fairly certain. I think I also yeah. mentioned that there was some kind of, when he was a young boy, some kind of, there was, there was some kind of reading done uh, that he was told that he maybe would be a winter monarch. Oh, this is the story that comes, again, it comes in what I call the developed Buddhist legend. I don't think one finds it in the older scriptures where the Brahmin astrologers come or sign readers and they come and they look at his physical features and they say he'll become either, if he stays at home, he'll become a world, wheel turning monarch. But if he is exposed to the sufferings of life, then he'll go forth and become a great spiritual teacher, a Buddha. And that is part of the traditional legend of the Buddha, but I don't, it might actually come in the sutta, in the sutta Nipata, but a portion that's considered a later edition. Yeah, anyway, that require, that's a, a big topic itself. It would require a lot of exploration and explanation. Honorable Sir? Whoops. Honorable Sir, uh, you mentioned that the uh, Mahayana and Theravada are different ways of looking at Buddha's life and yeah. practice. So in your opinion, if a faithful follower of Mahayana practices the what he or she is supposed to practice faithfully, would he or she get the same kind of results that the faithful follower of um, Mahayana and Hinayana yeah. uh, would achieve? Uh, mm. How does, in your opinion, how, how does that play into, how does conviction or belief system play into the final results, okay. which is to gain the body? Okay, okay, this raises actually an interesting point. And that is in the development of Theravada Buddhism, and probably actually this idea extends across all of the different Buddhist traditions, that there are three separate sort of vehicles or three different means or systems for reaching enlightenment. And these become the three vehicles or yanas. So one is called the Shravaka yana, this is the vehicle of the disciples. Those who hear the teaching from the Buddha, they become disciples under the Buddha, follow the Noble Eightfold Path, four foundations of mindfulness and so forth, and achieve arahatship. They gain liberation, enlightenment as arahat, followers of the Buddha. The second vehicle is the vehicle of Pratyeka Buddhas or Pacheka Buddhas. Though it's such a strange conception of a vehicle that because the Pacheka Buddha is somebody who achieves enlightenment himself without dependence on a teacher, but then decides not to teach the Dhamma, but to remain silent. So I know, I don't think I've ever met anybody who aspires to follow the Pacheka Buddha vehicle. <laughs> But because the Pacheka Buddha is mentioned in the texts 
even of early Buddhism, so it becomes, the past to become a Pacheka Buddha becomes construed as a separate vehicle. Then the third vehicle is the Bodhisattva Yana, that is the vehicle of the Bodhisattva who's aspiring to Buddhahood. And then that Bodhisattva Yana is what comes to be called Mahayana, which the word great vehicle, originally it didn't designate a separate school or system of Buddhism, but it was used as a designation for the Bodhisattva path because the Bodhisattva aims at the Mahabodhi, the great enlightenment of Buddhahood. Okay, now, as Buddhism develops, the idea comes that a follower of the Buddha can make the vow or aspiration to follow any of these three paths, any of these three vehicles. So if one aspires to reach arhatship, which can be either quickly through the direct path to arhatship, or else to become arhatship as a great disciple of the Buddha, or even as a chief disciple of the Buddha, one has to form that aspiration, and then one has to follow or practice the paramitas to a certain extent, the extent sufficient to achieve enlightenment as an arahat. So one practices the paramitas, the same paramitas as a bodhisattva will practice, but not to the full extent. And then on top of the paramitas, one practices or develops the meditations of the four foundations of mindfulness or samatha and vipassana, serenity and insight. And when the paramitas are sufficient and the practice of the foundations of mindfulness is sufficient, then one reaches enlightenment as an arhat. Alternatively, one, forms the, one could form the aspiration to reach the full enlightenment of Buddhahood, then one has to practice the paramitas over a much, much longer period in order to reach Buddhahood. And so how one emerges, whether as an arhat, let's say Pacheka Buddha, or as a fully enlightened Buddha, will depend upon one's aspiration, one's vow, one's determination, and then one's practices, one's accumulations of the paramitas. Does that answer the question? You have to use the microphone. Please use the microphone. As Yeah. So I'm I'm from the Tiawara camp. So excuse me. I'm from the Tiawara Tiawara group. Tiawara. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, so the thinking, I think, what you mentioned is like, if some, if would I would I be would I be thinking like if if there's a Mahayana person practicing. Yeah. Buddhism. Yeah. What is the ultimate goal? I mean, it's, it, it's, is it the Bodhisattva is there going to be, I think I'm not understanding the Bodhisattva concept probably. Okay. The, the Bodhisattva is, we could say, one who is aspiring to Buddhahood. So the Buddha is the one who discovers the Dhamma at a time when it doesn't exist in the world and then establish, establishes the Dharma in the world so that many other people can follow the Dharma and gain liberation. So for this reason, the Buddha is one who opens the doors to liberation to countless sentient beings, countless living beings. And so a bodhisattva is one who aspires to reach Buddhahood. So that is the basic meaning of bodhisattva. So each Mahayana follower aspires to be Bodhisattva at some point? point? Is that the answer? Basically, yes. Yeah. Okay. Though, 
I mean, there are many complexities within Mahayana Buddhism, and I'm not able to, you know, to discuss them in a, a short talk. <laughs> but basically, that, that is, we could say that that is the original vision or conception behind the emergence of Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, those are actually four stages on the way to our hardship. Yeah. So my question is this, and I asked this before, and I have to and answer. I'd like to ask this question to you again. If someone aspires to be a street emperor, yeah. and when the person do reach that stage, yeah. can that person decide to change to become a Buddha? I see, I see. Thank you. I see, okay, I see. Okay, the question is... Yeah, I think it's better to keep the little... Okay. So, in the, early, the scriptures of early Buddhism, there are four stages towards full liberation. <clears throat> so, the first stage is called stream entera. Stream entera has only seven more lives to be lived either in the human or celestial realm. The once returner is one who has one more existence in the sensual realm of, exi of existence. The non-returner who will be reborn in one of the divine realms and reach final liberation there. And then the fourth is the stage of our hardship, one who is fully liberated. So the question is, if somebody achieves the stage of stream entera, can that person then, <coughs> let's say, change buses, <laughs> change planes at, <laughs> at, in Atlanta, Georgia, so to speak, the Atlanta airport, and then get on <laughs> the plane going to Buddhahood? Can that person then change vehicles to go over to the bodhisattva vehicle towards Buddhahood. Again, this is a complex answer to this question. From the standpoint of early Buddhism, the answer would be no. Because once one becomes a stream enterer, then one is fixed in destination, which means that one has seven more lives at most, and it said that even if one can't advance further or quickly, if one is very slow in one's progress, at the seventh life, one will achieve our hardship and thereby put an end to the cycle of birth and death. And, but in order to follow the Bodhisattva vehicle, one has to take birth countless times in the future in order to practice the paramitas. So if one reaches stream entry, that is the end to one's, well, that cuts off the ability to switch over to the bodhisattva path. So that is my answer from the standpoint of early Buddhism, but I believe even starting in the more expanded Prajnaparamita Sutra, they speak about how somebody can switch over from, from the stage of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, and then enter upon the, the bodhisattva vehicle. So which is the case? I mean, I'm not qualified to say. I could just say what the different scriptures say, but... Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of the bringer of that news, the bad news is that our time is up. Yeah. However, um, you have another chance to visit with the Venerable uh, this afternoon when we meet in, from 1 to 2.30 for a workshop on Venerable Bhikkhubodhi's book in the Buddha's words. And if you are interested in the book, we have it outside and feel free to grab a copy of it. Uh, I was also told that there are various books from the English Dharma Group, and by the way, I'm Barbara, a member of the English Dharma Group, that there are various books from the English Dharma Group and the temple outside for you to take home um, for free. Um, another opportunity for you to uh, meet uh, Venerable Bodhi 
will be tomorrow at Rice University. Uh, he will speak on the importance of human value and the crisis of our time at 4 o'clock. Uh, we have flyers outside on our table if you are interested to come and join uh, his talk at Rice University. So at this point, um, I will hand it over to Venerable Katapuna to um, 